Hey, Kedar. Um, thanks for enrolling in this mock interview. Um, so this is going to be based on Amazon's data scientist um, interview, primarily focusing on machine learning questions today. And um, of course, the entire, you know, the Amazon, um, you know, interview is going to be, um, especially for the machine learning round, it's going to be 45 minutes to 60 minutes. Uh, but this is much more like a condensed version of it. But we'll still cover some of the questions that could potentially be asked during the actual Amazon interview. Um, and I'll have some breadstock questions and some case question. And then towards the, towards the end, um, I'll give you an assessment in terms of, you know, what areas you did really well and what are some areas that you can definitely improve. Does that sound good with you? Sounds great. Awesome. Okay, so I want to go ahead and start with some breadstock question. And the first question I have for you is the following. Um, what is the variance and bias trade-off? Yes, thanks for the question. So um, starting with bias, bias can be defined as as essentially the deviation of a model prediction um, uh, uh, from the training data, whereas variance can be defined as the deviation of the model predictions um, uh, from, from any unobserved or, or, or uh, like any test data. And typically um, bias and variance uh, tends to be negatively uh, sort of correlated, right? So, um, so that's why we need to make this bias variance trade-off to improve the variance most often, right? Um, uh, like at the cost of bias, does that make sense? Yeah, that sounds good. And I just have one follow up question on that. So um, does the flexibility of the model, so let's just think about a decision boundary of a classification model, right? Mm -hmm. um, does a flexibility model have anything to do with the variance and bias trade-off? Hmm. Uh, uh, like just a quick follow-up question on that. What do you specifically mean by flexibility here? So we can kind of think about it as, um, so imagine if you have like a, a two-dimensional plane, okay? Um, and you have a values that are zero or one, okay? And you your your model is essentially going to create a decision boundary that will define a certain region as fraud or sorry, a value of one or, um, or value of zero, right? Mm -hmm. So when you think about how flexible that decision boundary, boundary is, how do you think that that is related to the variance and the bias trade-off of, of a model? Interesting. So, um, uh, so I would uh, sort of uh, think about that question in this way, that the decision boundary would definitely shift as we tend to make this bias variance trade off um, uh, like because that is essentially what we are doing right we are changing the errors so um, so now whether um, uh, like whether the decision boundary expands or contracts depends on the direction in which we choose to make our bias variance trade off right as in um, like basically the criteria that govern whether um, like a single record should be classified as one or zero um, uh, might typically, uh, like I, I don't know, increase or decrease based on how we choose to increase the variance of this classification model. Got it. <clears throat> All right. So the next question I have for you is, um, what's the difference between uh, boosting and bagging? Yes, so boosting and bagging are both ensemble machine learning techniques. Um, uh, bagging entails um, uh, like using the sampling method bootstrap to be able to um, uh, randomly sample with replacement um, multiple sub samples of the data on which we train weak learners and then we aggregate um, uh, uh, like the final predictions of uh, like from those weak learners to be able to create our final prediction, right? Um, yeah. And then, and then boosting is also um, uh, is also an ensemble machine learning technique. But here, um, uh, like the subsequent subsamples of the data um, depend on how well the previous model in our ensemble was able to predict um, uh, the final target of that. Of that record, does that make sense, or would you like yeah. to elaborate? Um, no, that makes sense. Um, okay, so I have a follow-up question on this. So, 
in both the boosting and the bagging case, so we're a lot, you know, basically tree based models uh, utilize one of these two, right? Yes. It could, be a bag, it, could boost, it could be boosting. Now, as you're increasing the number of trees, um, how do you think that affects the variance and bias of the boosting based model versus the bagging based model? Can you elaborate on that? Yes. So I'll talk first about boosting. Um, uh, so uh, like if you think about um, how how the subsequent subsampling happens, um, uh, like the subsequent subsampling um, uh, tends to uh, like tends to oversample the records which were badly predicted, right, by the previous uh, learners, right. Uh, so so as so as the number of subsamples or as the number of uh, sort of models or weak learners that we have increases, right. Um, I would expect my model um, uh, to uh, like sort of tend to overfit those, which means that the bias would go down and the variance may go up. Whereas in the bagging case, um, since we are just simply increasing the number of learners, um, I would expect um, uh, like I would expect that the variance would go down um, and the bias um, uh, typically would go um, like would go up in this case. Based on that, does that it. make sense? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, so um, now I'd like to segue over to the uh, over to a case question, and the question I have for you is, um, <clears throat> how would you detect seller fraud on Amazon.com? Hmm, interesting. Um, before I sort of get into um, uh, like get into my response here, I'd like to ensure uh, that I clearly understand the problem presented to me. And to uh, sort of uh, do that, I'd first like to clarify my understanding of what seller fraud on Amazon.com would entail. So if I think about um, uh, like if I think about Amazon's ecosystem, it is basically uh, like an e-commerce website, um, uh, like in which sellers um, um, make some representations about the item on the website and the buyer based on those uh, makes um, uh, uh, like makes a purchase decision assuming that the information that the seller has given them is correct right so um, so typically um, uh, like the way that I would uh, think of fraud in this case is if the seller misrepresents right uh, misrepresents some of uh, yeah, I guess I misspelled that. But like, if the uh, like if the seller misrepresents some of the information on their listing page, which caused the buyer to make a um, uh, like to make a purchase decision that they did not expect, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's a good um, <clears throat> that's a good way to look at seller fraud. Okay. Um, uh, then secondly, um, uh, like I just uh, sort of like to clarify my thinking here. So, um, so since a seller can have multiple transactions, right? Um, not all those transactions may be fraudulent, right? Um, uh, like the seller may um, uh, like may only misrepresent some of the items. Um, but since here the question more uh, sort of requires me to talk about seller fraud. I just want to point out that um, uh, that to do this, we would have to identify some decision boundary on the number of fraudulent transactions to sort of um, uh, like segment a seller as a fraudulent seller. Does that sound good, or uh, like would you like me to take a slightly different approach here? Um, I, I would say whatever you know, what you just said sounds good, um, and then I would kind of proceed your analysis uh, from there. Okay. Perfect. So, um, so can I have a few minutes uh, to sort of frame my thinking on some of the factors and how, uh, like, I would go about finally implementing this? Definitely. Yeah. 
sort of uh, the way that I would look at this problem is that I break down the factors that I would like to evaluate at a transaction level into seller based listing based and and um, uh, like also the transaction based right based on every individual transaction. When I consider seller based factors, I would consider factors like the tenure of the seller, the number of listings that the seller has um, and and the number of positive reviews that are um, uh, like that may be associated with that particular seller. Because if I think of this um, uh, like sellers who are like fairly tenured on the platform, have a lot of listings and a lot of positive reviews are like fairly less likely to be fraudulent sellers because they would have been identified in some way, shape or form previously. Right. Um, uh, uh, like if I think of listing based factors, um, uh, like I'm thinking of uh, like inputs that the seller may provide us, which may indicate some sort of fraud intent, right? So uh, like the seller could do some form of misrepresentation in the item title, the seller may use um, like images which are not true images of the item, which is also some form of fraud and also the seller might make some misrepresentations in the item description. So I create some features around that. And also I'd look at some transaction based factors um, uh, like basically does the seller have a lot of previous transactions um, uh, like has the seller withdrawn their money quickly because um, like we can um, like like as you think of fraud the goal of the seller is to quickly monetize um, uh, like whatever their activities are on the uh, like on these platforms. So typically sellers would like to go and just quickly withdraw the money. So I create some factors um, based on this. And um, and then I would have to create some form of label data and try and uh, sort of uh, uh, like predict that using these factors, right? And that labeling would okay. have to be created based on true fraud intent. Okay, got it. So let's um, presume that in this case, uh, labels do exist, okay? Um, so using that label along with the signals that you're proposing, um, what is the next step for you? Okay. So, um, so like when you say labels do exist, I'd like to further clarify that just a little bit. So, so here I'm assuming that like, since we are building this model at a transaction level, we know at a transaction level, whether that transaction was fraud or not through like whatever means of ours, right? So we have essentially two types of labels. So one is whether a particular transaction is a fraudulent transaction. Um, and then another label that is applied to an actual seller, um, you know, basically they would be placed in the blacklist. Interesting. Okay, perfect. So, um, so here, what I would do is that, um, like, since we already laid out that we would have a certain decision boundary at a transaction level post, which we would attribute that seller as a, um, like as a fraudulent seller, um, uh, like what I would do, uh, first is that, is that maybe I would use uh, this label, uh, which has been applied to the seller into, um, uh, like maybe I would include that as a, um, uh, like to begin with as a feature in my seller based attributes. And then I would focus mainly on the transaction level data, right? Um, like to begin with, um, and, uh, and then, um, I would, uh, uh, like create some features, um, uh, out of all these different factors. Like I can go into those features if you like, uh, like if you'd like, but uh, like essentially the goal would be to use any sort of um, like binary model, um, uh, like something like a logistic regression or something um, uh, like decision trees or random forest to be able to sort of predict that. And then um, just thinking about the problem once again, right? Um, since this is a fraud problem, uh, uh, like fraud on platforms like Amazon is typically like a very rare event which means that the PN ratio or the number of positives to negatives would be very, very low, which means that if you essentially predict every transaction is a non-fraud transaction, you are likely to get a very high accuracy rate. So to be able to uh, like sort of address for that upfront, what we would do, um, uh, like what we would have to do is that we would have to sample the data in such a way that we sam um, that we oversample the positives or like we oversample um, uh, like those transactions which are fraudulent transactions. So this can be done in a couple of different ways. One that we could just manually upsample those transactions 
or or um, uh, like the second way would be that we find out um, uh, some uh, like some sort of characteristics of transactions that are not fraud and then we exclude those early on to be able to already create a focused data set on which we would be doing this modeling of ours does that make sense okay that makes sense um, okay so i want to talk a little bit more about your modeling technique so you proposed some ideas about maybe using logistic regression model or tree based or random forest um, but can you talk a little bit more about the future engineering and future selection process during the model? Hmm. Interesting. So, um, like before I get into that, I just want to sort of um, like lay out some of uh, the other considerations here, right? So, since the target variable is, as I mentioned, is a binary one zero, right? Um, uh, like if I were to use um, uh, something like a decision tree. I cannot use features uh, uh, like which are directly like string based features, right? As in like just um, like a name of the seller or something. I would have to use some form of encoding, right? So, um, so like just want to keep that as a key consideration in my uh, sort of um, like um, uh, like in my sort of understanding. Uh, going back uh, to some of the factors that I laid out here, right? Um, I would um, I would um, label the tenure as a continuous variable and just I would count uh, that as I would count that as uh, as the total uh, time taken uh, time from first transaction on on Amazon right um, I would uh, create um, uh, and then similarly like with the item, uh, like with the item title, what I could uh, sort of do is I could create uh, some uh, binary I could create some binary features around um, if the title matches the description as in like if every word in the title is also present in the description because that is something that I would expect right um, like which sort of talks about some form of consistency right um, uh, and and yeah um, uh, like if we want to look at the number of positive reviews we could just again just simply take account of the positive reviews on that particular item. Got it okay so so um, so basically you're going to take some of the raw signals and extract additional uh, signals that could be incorporated in a model. Uh, now, suppose that you do, you end up with, you know, you continue this process of creating potential signals, right? Um, how do you ultimately um, apply future selection to decide which signals should belong in a model and which should, signals shouldn't? Hmm. Interesting. So, uh, since this is a classification model, and uh, we need to do some form of uh, feature selection. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to draw, uh, like I'm trying to draw parallels between regularization uh, and this uh, particular thing, and um, like and then especially uh, like techniques like lasso, um, like which can be used um, uh, like to do some form of feature selection for uh, for models with continuous uh, targets. Um, let's see. So what I could do is uh, is that I could initially implement some form of I'm thinking of uh, techniques such as random forest where we get uh, some sort of uh, like variable importance signals through those models, but uh, I'm not able to clearly articulate exactly how I would do that. But I um, like okay. but I do know that random forest has uh, uh, some sort of estimators like that. Okay, got it. All right. Um, now I want to focus more on uh, the evaluation aspect. So what are the metrics you would use to evaluate the performance of your model? Right. So as we um, like as we sort of uh, begin to train our model or train multiple models to choose the right model, typically the way that this is done is um, like is by using uh, something called an ROC curve um, or 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 similarly uh, like a precision recall curve where we plot the precision recall across different models and then uh, based on AUC um, like we select um, like the model of choice um, like the, um, like 
So uh, would you like me to clarify AUC or just uh, move on at this point? No, I think this is good enough. Um, now, I have a follow-up question on this. So uh, what about accuracy? Can you use accuracy to basically evaluate the performance of this classification model? So um, just accuracy by itself um, uh, would tend to be slightly inflated um, uh, since this is... Uh, so... So since the accuracy that we um, uh, uh, that we compute on this small subset of data uh, may not hold consistent across unobserved data, so I would not want to use something uh, like just like prediction accuracy. And since that accuracy can also uh, like be biased by the way that we choose the model, right? The way that we design the model up front and the hyperparameters. Got it. Got it. Um, all right. And one last question I have is, um, so is your model predicting at like basically a transaction level uh, or is it making a prediction that a particular fraud, uh, a seller is a fraudulent or not? And I have some follow up questions on that. Yes. So um, uh, like at least at, at this point, based on our previous conversation, um, like this model would make a prediction at a transaction level and then we would have to aggregate those predictions into a sort of signal for the seller, much like you have already described. Okay, got it. So I just want to walk through a concrete example real quick. So suppose that a particular seller has, let's just say five events um, and none of these transactions have been uh, predicted as fraud just yet. Uh, but your model is saying that on the third transaction, the, the, this, this particular item is fraudulent. So how do you use that information as a way to extrapolate whether a particular seller is a fraud or not? Interesting. So, um, so here, I think, uh, like we would need to do some historical data analysis, right? Um, uh, sort of, we would have to uh, go back and then use this exact same model on some of our historical data that we have not used maybe to even build this model, right? Um, uh, to be able to help establish our decision boundary, right? Essentially that um, uh, that like at, at what number of fraud transactions um, uh, does a seller, uh, uh, like do we have high confidence that a seller is truly fraudulent, right? Because there may be just one transaction which may get classified as fraud, um, like even due to a mistake, right, by the seller, yeah. right? So that is essentially what we want to avoid because the implications, as um, like as I would expect from uh, like from such a fraud model, would be that there would be some sort of restrictions that would be placed on the seller that they cannot transact on the site or maybe like higher fees in some form. So that would be a very, very strong negative experience for the seller and, uh, and, and um, like just going back to business and product sense, our, um, uh, our boundaries for making such extreme uh, determinations should be fairly high and we should have like close to 100% confidence. That okay, is got it. Yeah. Now, one, one last question I have for you on that realm. Um, so what do you think the pros and cons are if you were to make a prediction, so ultimately you have to define what the prediction point is for the model, right? So at what transaction do you make uh, a prediction that a, 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 a seller is fraudulent or not, right? Uh, whether it's on the first transaction, the second transaction, third transaction, or uh, nth transaction. Now, what do you think the pros and cons are if you were to make a prediction at the first transaction level versus let's just say the 20th transaction. Yeah. Uh, that, so think about, think about it for, you know, just uh, kind of provide like a summary of it in, in a minute. So we yeah, can kind of wrap up. Yeah. This. Yeah. Um, uh, makes sense. So, so I would say that the benefit of being uh, like, of being able to predict early would be that we would be able to mitigate any, um, um, uh, like any further bad experiences that our, um, uh, like our buyers may have. But if we uh, make the prediction based on less information, essentially, um, um, uh, like I would expect that the likelihood of making a wrong prediction would go up. 
right whereas um like if we took more time and then had more events to um uh, like to make our prediction as we know that like with more data like the accuracy of models goes up right so um like our prediction accuracy would go up but um like we would have uh, sort of had the seller commit fraud all the way until we were able to make this determination so that is the sort of a uh, trade off that we need to make and um and um like if we have some a priori quantification of of what each fraud transaction costs in the long term um uh, uh like in terms of customer lifetime value we may be able to use that to be able to determine at what point we wish to determine uh, the Got transaction okay great yeah so that's the um uh overall the questions that i want to ask uh and now that is the end of the question portion and we're going to segue over to the assessment uh for those who are watching this is basically the part in which you know i'm uh, providing a feedback to kdar in terms of what are his good uh the way in which he responded what are some good points that he hit and what are points that he can definitely improve in the future um okay so let's start with the uh the breadth style question so the first question that i asked you is about um uh basically the variance and bias trade off so mm-hmm. i would say that the the response that you provided was solid so you uh basically explain what is a definition of variance and bias uh trade off of a model mm-hmm. um you had accurate um interpretation of what those are So the variance is definitely the variability of the model prediction and the bias is deviation of the model prediction from the actual values. And you mentioned the trade-off which is that if variance goes up, bias goes down, vice versa. Uh so definitely good job in terms of clearly defining what the variance bias trade-off are is. Um now I think the, the follow-up question I have for you, I think this is maybe you were a little bit confused about what I was asking. Um But basically I was talking about I was I wanted you to kind of relate the flexibility of a model to the variance and bias trade off. So what I mean by that is um when you think about um like a classification model for instance ultimately it's drawing a decision boundary, right? And this decision boundary um is a lot is determined on a number of factors from how many signals you have because the more signals you have more uh your overfitting and so therefore the you're going to get a lot more flexibility uh with the decision boundary of of this model right um and also like hyperparameters as well have an effect on the decision boundary <coughs> excuse me so what i wanted to um wanted to assess was can you think about how the decision boundary or the flexibility of model would affect the variance and bias trade off Um and so the idea is that the more flexible the model um the higher the variance because the more flexible the model it means that it's it's basically overfitting itself on training data. Um so higher the variance but lower on the bias. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that does. Yeah. All right. The next question is about um what's the difference between boosting and bagging? Um so once again I would say that you provided a solid response. Um you had a very clear explanation of the difference between boosting and bagging. Um and your interpretation and when I asked some follow-up questions about okay what happens if you were to increase the number of trees how does that affect uh the bias and variance of boosting versus bagging models? Um your definition was correct that uh when when you increase the number of trees um in in the bagging world um what happens is that the variance of the model is going to decrease whereas the variance is going to uh sorry whereas the bias is going to um increase and for boosting case if you're increasing the number of uh trees um what's happening is that the model is going to start to overfit and so the variance of the model is going to increase while the um the bias of the model is going to decrease uh so that was uh that was a really good response Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Yep. All right. So the next question is um a case question, right? And um I would say overall um you covered really uh, your the structure of how you're engaging this problem was really good. Uh you started by trying to clearly understand 
what a seller fraud is um, and, and um, talked about potential data signals that you could use as a way to detect uh, a seller fraud. And then you segue over to basically the methodology part. Uh, a really good framework in just about any business case problems, whether it is product sense or machine learning problem in general, is that you always want to start with the business context of the problem. Um, and then you want to propose uh, the statistical methodology that you would use to solve that problem and then relate it back to the business. Um, and in your case, you provided these areas. So um, it's really good job. It is really great that you were able to provide a structure that um, that's sound. Okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about a couple points that I have for you um, in terms of, I guess, areas for improvement. Um, let me just paste my assessment here in the bottom. Um, oh, and another thing that I just want to mention is that um, the way you listed the signals were, uh, I, thought it was, it th I thought it was really good. Um, it was very, it was uh, quite um, comprehensive in a sense that you started with some category, right? So uh, category, and then you listed some potential signals that you could include in each of the category. I would say that's a really good exercise. And for the viewers out there, um, you are going to run into a lot of these ML-based situations where, they're, where the interviewer is going to ask you to list potential signals that you could include in a model. And instead of just kind of randomly sort of think about what signals you're going to include, Think about a potential area that you could tackle and then list signals that are within that area. So in Kedar's case, what he went about doing is, okay, I'm going to think about potential signals that are relevant for seller base, listing base, transaction base. Um, and then he went about listing it. That's a really good technique as a way to um, list as many signals as you can. Um, so. Um, so it's really good that you did that, and, and for the viewers out there, I would definitely encourage you to also use this technique when, um, when you need to do these kind of feature engineering exercise. Um, the next thing I want to mention is, um, so typically when you're making a prediction about fraud, um, notice that you, you're making an assumption that sellers are somewhat independent to each other, but if you really think about it, um, if you get blacklisted from Amazon, right, you could simply just create a new account, right? You could potentially use a new email address. You could use, um, uh, you know, you could basically, you, it's sort of somewhat in your interest to create as many accounts as you can. Um, and then, you know, provide these, uh, items that are, you know, mis misrepresent, rent, misrepresenting of what the buyer is expecting, right? Um, so another good set of signals that you could have definitely proposed are device IDs and IP addresses. Um, and you can kind of think about it in terms of like a network in a sense that, you know, um, if a particular email address has been flagged, but it's, it's connected to a, an IP address, then maybe you could draw an inference that um, all other IP, uh, all other um, email addresses that are connected to this IP address um, is a, is uh, should be suspected as being fraudulent, right? So you could come up with some uh, additional future signals um, based on that technique as well. And it's a very common set of uh, techniques that are used in um, you know when it comes to building a fraud fraud model. Does that make sense? Yep. All right, and um, one thing that you mentioned, uh, which I thought was really good, was also mentioning about the class imbalance. Um, definitely, this is something that you're going to see in a lot of these fraud-based problems. Um, and you talked about the idea of using downsampling and outsampling, so that's really good. Um, now, when I asked about how you would actually do future selection, um, I didn't think your, your response was far-fetched. So you did kind of talk about, you know, maybe I can use lasso. Uh, logistic regression model, uh, or I can use variable importance um, from random forest. Um, these two are actually, you know, these two techniques are actually used when it comes to doing feature selection. Uh, so it wasn't too far fetched from, you know, what would be considered best, best practice in a sense. Um, the one other technique that you could have definitely mentioned is um, using PCA. 
as a way to represent this feature set in, in a lower dimension. And so thereby you would end up with a subset of features. Um, and of course there are additional other uh, you know, feature selection techniques um, that, that could be used. Uh, there's a filtering technique um, and you know, a bunch of others. Um, but the point is, you know, can, do you first of all understand what feature selection is? Is can you list maybe one or two techniques that that you could use as a way to um, identify a subset of features for model? Uh, and and I, I thought you did that, so uh, so it was a good um, kind of response to the follow up question I had. Um, and the last point I want to make is in terms of evaluation. Um, so it's good that you recognize that you want to use metrics like AUC, precision and recall, um, and avoid using accuracy. Um, the only thing I, I, I thought you could have definitely mentioned in this part is also, um, uh, you know, you want to basically split your data set in terms of training and test, right? Um, and mentioning that along with, you know, cross validation uh, would have been important points. You definitely would have wanted to cover um, in the evaluation portion. Uh, but of course, I could have asked some additional follow-up question, but I wanted to see, you know, whether this is something that's on top of your head and you're able to kind of explain this um, out loud. So uh, so I'd be mindful of that the next time you need to elaborate on how you would evaluate a model. Interesting. Thank you.